It's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, uh, of uh, awardees of the Mickelson's Prize. So, uh, Patricia Ealing, who's a research fellow at Monash University, and the fact that she was selected has nothing to do with the fact that the chair of the board of the HBP is from Australia. <laughs> Absolutely promised. So, Patricia, don't feel, um, how would I say, embarrassed uh, talking about uh, the previous speakers who have so many awards and prizes. You are still young. <laughs> the future is yours, and I'm sure that by that time you'll be also honored and uh, loaded uh, with prizes. So, you re I Patricia received her PhD actually quite recently in 2014 from the University of Melbourne and where you have been uh, studying human leukocyte antigen associated adverse drug reaction uh, abacavir sensitivity syndrome. So this has provided a new paradigm for presentation of drugs by HLA molecules that you published in Nature and was recognized also already by a, a, a Victorian Premier's Award in 2013. So, um, we are very happy to, to have you here and to present a transformative project in the area of, immuni of immunology. And uh, um, I also give you then 15 minutes and, um, and then we'll have a few questions for you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, can I firstly say that I'm very honoured to be here as one of the recipients of the Michelson Prize and to have a chance to talk to you about some of the work that we're doing to try and understand the contribution of a novel subset of uh, peptides to the immune response, uh, in, particular, in particular to um, immune responses to influenza virus. So today what I'd like to do is basically give a little bit of background, firstly starting with something that's uh, quite familiar, uh, which is the classical HLA class 1 antigen processing presentation pathway, before looking at the generation of splice peptides and how they enter into this pathway, how we and others are trying to identify these peptides in a high throughput manner using mass spectrometry, and then where we're going with this with regards to mapping the contribution of these peptides uh, to the immunopeptidome in influenza infection and looking to see whether these can actually be harnessed in an immune response. So the classical HLA class 1 antigen processing and presentation pathway is probably fairly familiar to most people in this room. So the HLA molecules are basically, uh, they're expressed by most nucleated cells of the body and their role is to present peptides at the cell surface that generate a sort of summary of the protein production ongoing within the cell. So just shown here, we have our, our proteins within the cell. These are broken down by the proteasome through a hydrolysis reaction and then become available to be transported into the endoplasmic reticulum via the transporter associated with antigen processing where they're available for binding to the HLA molecules. And this stabilizes the HLA molecule, allowing it to go out to the cell surface. And we then have this array of peptides being presented by the HLA that's known as the immunopeptidome. And so when we have a virus, uh, the virus also uh, is producing uh, proteins within the cell, these get broken down and in enter into this same pathway and hopefully um, some of these peptides when they're presented at the cell surface are actually recognised as novel and can stimulate T cell responses. So a CD8 T cell response, target against these specific peptides and then helping eliminate the virus infected cells. So the HLA molecules are incredibly diverse across the human population. We have three loci encoding the classical HLA class 1 and these there are actually thousands of different variants. The uh, variations within these molecules predominantly map to this region here, which is the antigen binding cleft, where we have peptides of 9 to 12 amino acids usually binding within this group. And what these polymorphism, polymorphisms sorry, basically mean is that we have slight uh, differences in the chemistry within this group that bias uh, presentation of peptides towards peptides that have anchor residues that will help them anchor within these anchor pockets. So you can imagine that different HLA molecules, you'll, you'll see sort of, um, if you sequence large numbers of peptides isolated from these molecules, you'll see biases towards particular amino acids at a couple of these anchor locations. And this will be different between different uh, variants of the HLA. And so when it comes to basically defining what peptides are stimulating our CD8 T cell responses, there's a few different uh, sort of workflows that you can go about to sort of isolate these peptides. And one quite long-standing workflow is to screen overlapping peptide libraries. So if you have a CD8 T cell that's um, responding to a particular antigen, looking for um, basically taking the sequence of that antigen, 
and generating overlapping peptide libraries, adding them to your antigen, antigen presenting cell and looking for a response. And so this is based on knowledge of the protein sequence encoded by the antigen. A second approach, and, uh, and one that is uh, basically the bread and butter with our, within our laboratory, is the sequencing of peptides isolated from HLA molecules using mass spectrometry. So in this case, we isolate um, these molecules from cells, we then elute off the peptides, and then use tandem mass spectrometry to fragment these peptides and determine their sequence by aligning their masses and their fragmentation spectra against the source proteome. Um, and this is what's known as database searching. So, both of these approaches, however, are based on one really key assumption, and that is that the peptides that are produced by the breakdown of proteins by the proteasome match directly to the protein sequences or the initial protein sequence. However, over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, we're becoming increasingly aware that this isn't always the case. So the proteasome, as well as performing these hydrolysis reactions, can also perform reactions known as transpeptidation, where it takes two segments, either within or sometimes within the same protein, and it actually stitches these together. So these uh, can be separated by um, numerous amino acids. Or alternatively, it can also do this between peptides from separate proteins, and this is what's known as transplicing. So we have cis-spliced peptides from the same protein or transpliced from two different proteins. And this generates, as you can imagine, a much greater uh, diversity within the pool of peptides that are able to be presented by the HLA molecules. So the first such epitope to be described, this was back in 2004, and this was from um, FGF5. And it was an epitope that um, was being targeted by T cells uh, responding to renal cell carcinoma, and it's presented by the A3 molecule. And it was quite an elegant study using antigen-presenting cells, expressing mini-gene constructs. Oops, sorry, go back, maybe, yes. Uh, expressing mini-gene constructs of the FGF5 protein, and they showed, but by truncating and deleting various regions of this protein, that the epitope was mapped to these two distinct regions here. So these five amino acids here and four amino acids here stitched together. And in the years since, there's been a handful of other such spliced epitopes that have been defined in cancer models. And more recently as well, a few um, such spliced epitopes have been found in Listeria infection in mice being presented by mouse MHC models, uh, molecules. So whilst this does show that these spliced epitopes do, uh, are involved in immune responses, it doesn't really give us much idea of how common they are. And this is where mass spectrometry can really come to the fore. So as I mentioned earlier, what we do um, with regards to trying to identify peptides being presented by the HLA molecules is we take these HLA molecules, we elute off the peptides, and then we uh, use tandem mass spectrometry to basically fragment the peptides and look at their spectra. So in these data sets, we have all of these peptides available. However, when we search against the human proteome or against the, the um, viral proteome, we're only asking it to look for linear peptides. These splice peptides don't exist within this database, and so when we're doing this database searching approach, they disappear, they become invisible. We can't see them. And so in 2016, Lee et al published a a, not, a beautiful uh, paper in Science where they tried to get around this problem by generating a theoretical spliced peptide database. So what they did was they basically looked at the proteins of the human proteome and generated theoretical splice fragments, basically by taking segments of up to 25 amino acid separation and generating all 9 to 12 more amino acid peptides that could be generated by these sort of splicing events. And when they did this, they were able to bring these cis-spliced peptides back into focus. And quite staggeringly, what um, they found was that up around about 30% of the immunopeptidome of these different cell lines could be explained by cis splicing. And so this was you know, remarkable. We, we had no idea that there was that, that amount of contribution from these events. However, there are some limitations to this workflow. Firstly, it's computationally quite expensive. So the human uh, proteome, about 13 megabyte faster file when you're wanting to search this, these databases end up being 200, 300 gigabytes. So your search base is massively expanded, increasing the computational time. Secondly, it only considers cis splicing, and it also is biased against distant recombination partners. So we're only looking at 25 amino acid separation. And that very first FGF5 epitope was actually separated by 40 amino acids. So it would have been missed using this workflow. 
So we're taking a slightly different approach to try and identify cis and trans peptides within the immunopeptidome. And this is using a de novo assisted database searching algorithm, which is incorporated within PEAKS 8.5 software. And so basically what this does is it actually starts out with the peptide spectra and it comes up with hypotheses with regards to the sequences that could explain that spectra. And it searches for these within the, um, within the database, so within the source proteome that you've given it. When these are found within the proteome, these are our linear peptides. However, high confidence de novo sequence assignments is that fail um, to be matched to the proteome, we then put through our in-house software known as Hybrid Finder, looking for explanations of two segments either within a single protein that could give rise to this peptide, so cis splicing, as shown here, or two separate uh, proteins, so trans splicing. And we've put through various data sets from the immunopeptidone data sets from within our laboratory and also publicly available across various different alleles. And what we can find is that we can actually um, attribute various sequences to either linear, cis, or trans peptides. And there's different balances of these in the immunopeptidones of different alleles. But what we really want to know with this technique is can we actually find splice peptides that are produced from viral antigens during infection? So as part of a collaboration with Catherine Kitsieska's laboratory at um, the Peter Doherty Institute, we've been performing various epitope discovery experiments. And one of the early experiments that we did was looking for influenza B-derived epitopes being presented by the common HLA molecule HLA-AO201. And to do this, we took uh, B lymphoblastoid cell line, um, which was transfected with the A2 molecule. We then infected this with B Malaysia virus for 12 hours before uh, confirming infection um, using flow cytometry for the MP protein, and then lysing these infected cells, immunoaffinity purifying out the HLA class 1 molecules, in this case using an antibody specific for um, AO201, elute these with acetic acid, separate the proteins from the peptides using reverse phase HPLC, and then sequencing our peptides using tandem mass spectrometry. And initially, we were just going through um, a very standard workflow using database searching, uh, looking uh, at for peptides within the human or the B Malaysia proteome. And so, as we expected with this, we found that most of the peptides that we were isolating were 9 to 11 amino acids in length, consistent with class 1 ligands. They were biased towards uh, leucine at position 2 and valine and leucine at position 9, consistent with ligands of the A2 molecule. And in amongst these, we were able to map uh, some of these peptides or a small number of these peptides to the B Malaysia proteome. And these uh, traverse across various proteins within the uh, B Malaysia proteome. And Marius Kutsakis, a PhD student within Catherine's laboratory, then went on to, to test these for immunogenicity. So we separated these into six uh, different pools and took PBMCs from A2 positive individuals, cultured them with the peptide pools, and then after nine to 10 days uh, culture, perform a re-stimulation with the peptide pools, looking for interferon gamma production by the um, CD8 T cells. And in this particular individual, uh, we saw quite robust responses to this pool two. This was seen across, most, uh, across all of the donors that we tested, and we also saw some responses to other pools as well. Uh, and these could further be dissected down to the specific peptides within the pool. So this is um, the peptides within pool two, and we see that the responses are predominantly to this hemagglutinin uh, peptide here. And overall, we were able to map responses of varying degrees across different donors to five different peptides from uh, the influenza proteome. So this looks like an ideal data set for us then to look for cis and trans splice peptides derived from the influenza virus. And so we put this data, these data sets through this um, de novo searching algorithm or de novo searching workflow. And for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to focus on one of our infection data sets. So using this workflow, we firstly, uh, you can see we're seeing peptides that are tend to be 9 to 11 amino acids in length, and we see both cis and trans splice peptides coming up within the database using this workflow. These map to both the human and the flu uh, proteome, and when we look at those that are within the mapping to the flu proteome, what we see is we see an array of the linear peptides across the proteome as we'd seen previously, so consistent with our previous workflow, but with our cis splice peptides, we saw this quite striking um, enrichment within the hemagglutinin molecule. And what was even more exciting when we you know, turned down and look at these actual sequences that were providing um, these hits is that 
there, most of these sequences are actually sharing a C-terminal splice fragment, which is sitting here within the hemagglutinin protein. And this could either be explained by cis splicing with uh, portions of the hemagglutinin protein N-terminal to it or C-terminal to it. And we also saw another peptide here that actually had this segment slightly extended at the N-terminus um, of the spliced peptide, as well as a couple of linear epitopes that were overlapping this section, whilst our remaining linear epitopes were spread throughout, throughout the protein. And so to confirm these sequences, we've um, ordered in synthetic uh, peptides for some of these. And what you can see is that when we fragment the synthetic peptide, we get an exact match between this peptide spectra of the synthetic and the eluded peptides, giving us high confidence in our sequence assignment. So this is where we stand at the moment, and I would have to say that we actually have more questions than we have answers. Um, really, what we want to know right now is, do these peptides stimulate immune responses during infection? If so, can they be harnessed to prime an immune response? And then with this, can we also predict what antigens and regions of proteins are prone to splicing? We saw this massive enrichment of spliced peptides derived from a single region within the hemagglutinin molecule. Are similar regions being presented by different HLA? Or uh, would we see enrichment of other parts of the protein or different antigens? And, and we really don't know the answers to these questions at the moment. So what we're moving to do now is to basically uh, expand our analysis across influenza A and B viruses, looking at a couple of common HLA molecules, so the A2 molecule as well as the B8 molecule, and to try and define the rules for peptide splicing and the presentation of spliced peptides from um, a virus. And then also moving to test um, the epitopes or potential epitopes that we detect uh, alongside known and novel linear HLA ligands in the hope that we can identify novel contributors to the anti-influenza T cell response um, that might be novel candidates for epitope-based vaccines. So it just remains to thank all of those that have been involved in that, this work and the work going forward. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Patricia. Uh, congratulations again. Thank you. So, yes, go ahead. Did you also see evidence of modified peptides that might have a phosphorylation or something like that? So in this workflow, we've actually tailored it so that we're, we're not really considering the modifications because it expands the, the search space quite astronomically. We have done some assessments where we actually do go through and look with various modifications to make sure we're not misassigning spliced peptides to modified peptides. Um, but at, the, at this stage, no, we're not doing that. Um, that might be something to consider going forward, but it does massively expand the search space. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Um, that'd be beautiful. So, so I have a question about the, uh, where the peptides are coming from. Mm -hmm. So with regards, so from the viral uh, proteins or from, so at the moment we have been searching predominantly against uh, what's recognised as the um, express proteome. We have gone in and done some searches also against basically, you know, different reading frames and, and going back and forth to make sure we're not misassigning to, to things that are coming from alternate reading frames. We don't believe we are. It, does, it doesn't look like we... We don't get many hits in that, that regard. But um, it's all sort of an open-ended question at the moment. Okay. I see no more questions, so thank you very much. And <laughs>